there. This podcast is brought to you from aboutmeditation.com. Check out our free How to Meditate mini course, five easy lessons that teach you how to meditate in minutes. www.aboutmeditation.com. Welcome to the One Mind Podcast from AboutMeditation.com. My name's Morgan Dix, and I'm your host. On One Mind, we explore different angles on meditation, mindfulness, and health. We interview experts and everyday practitioners to bring you the stories, the science, and the exploration that will help you understand why this ancient practice is more relevant and important today than ever before. Hi everybody, welcome to our first show. I'm Morgan Dix, I'm a co-founder here at AboutMeditation.com. Before we jump into the interview with my good friend Kenzo An, I want to tell you a little bit about the show. So here's the plan. This is mostly an interview show, and we're going to talk with a range of people. Experts, scientists, teachers, and your average everyday meditator and mindfulness practitioner. We're going to share the stories that will hopefully help you stay motivated in your own meditation practice, but also to help you understand why and how meditation has gone mainstream. And not just to help you understand that, to help me understand it. It is an ongoing inquiry for me and something that that fascinates me. We're going to go into questions like, how are people using meditation? To what end and what benefit? How is it changing lives and improving health? And why now? Why has this ancient esoteric practice leapt from the cloistered halls of Eastern monasteries and ashrams into the arms of Silicon Valley investors and entrepreneurs and Wall Street bankers? That is like a very interesting question to me. And how is it elevating people's performance across all parts of their lives? So these are just some of the questions we're going to be going into. I, myself, I'm a passionate advocate of meditation. I've been practicing for about 20 years. And after living and working for about 14 of those years in a yoga and meditation ashram, I'm eager to share what I've learned with you and also mix it up with other people who have a lot more experience than I do. So for the last 15 months or so, I've I've mostly been blogging. Now I'm excited to move into this new podcast format. It's a totally different format, but I love dialogue and conversation. I've always felt that I can get closer to essential truths through conversation and and really take my own fascinations, my interests deeper through the chemistry of conversation where you can mix ideas challenge convictions, and get exposed to things you wouldn't otherwise know. It's always been fascinating to me, for example, to hear, to really understand how other people see the world because it's different. And I can't think of a better person to start the show than with one of my best friends in the world, Kenzo An. Kenzo and I have been Dharma brothers since the first time I met him on a meditation retreat in 1998 in Western Massachusetts. Kenzo is a complete inspiration to me. He and his wife, Diane, they're about to have their first child in, it could be this week or next week. It's about to happen, probably right when this podcast goes live. So congratulations, Kenzo. I think you're going to love this show. It's my first show, so I hope you'll be forgiving. We start really by exploring the relationship between sales and meditation. And then we transition into a deeper conversation about how meditation shapes art. And it's totally fascinating. So thank you for joining us. I think that's it. Let's jump right into the podcast. So great. Let's uh, jump in. Kenzo, welcome to the show. It is so great to have you here. Everyone Kenzo's one of my oldest friends, and it, it's a huge pleasure for me to welcome him onto the show today. Thanks, Morgan. It's great to be on the show. Hi, everyone. Kenzo, so I thought it would be helpful to start off by 
just going over a little bit of your history, how long have you been meditating? And currently, what kind of meditation do you practice? I, uh, I'm 39 years old now. I started experimenting with different things when I was a teenager, like around 13 or 14. But I didn't start a daily, uh, you know, more disciplined meditation practice until 1999. So I've been meditating regularly for about 15 years. Now, I, I, for most of that time, I've been practicing a, a style of meditation uh, taught by Andrew Cohen. But for the past year and a half, I guess you could say I'm, I'm, I'm kind of back more to my uh, experimenting stage with, with different styles and approaches. That's great. When you, when you did that practice with Andrew Cohen, the one that you did for 15 years, can you tell us a little bit about what that was? How long did you practice? Did you practice every day? And what was that style of practice? I practiced around one to two hours a day starting from 1999, uh, sometimes you know, longer during periods of extended retreats. And I guess the, there, there wasn't necessarily a, a, a name or a way that, he, that Andrew described this meditation, but I think you, you put it really well in your blogs when you describe a free awareness type practice. And in the style of practice that he taught, mm -hmm. it, the instructions are very simple. You, you just were still, you relax as deeply as possible, and at the same time also kept your attention alert and aware. And it was a combination of, of doing those three things that just let your consciousness become very fast and awake while at the same time being very, very at ease. Just so you know, Kenzo and I did this practice together. I've known Kenzo for 15 years. And I love the way you said, Kenzo, fast. It allowed your awareness to be fast. What did you mean by that? Uh, I said fast. Do you think I said fast? Oh, I thought you said fast. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I, said, I said fast, but... Fast. Vast. I, vast. Vast. I said vast, vast, not fast. That that makes sense. All right. So tell when you say vast, can you say a little bit more about that? When you, when your awareness is really vast, what is that experience? I guess maybe another way to say vast would be free. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like in in meditation, it's a way of allowing up my attention, not getting hung up or stuck in some kind of cul-de-sac, but just having the an enormous amount of room to do and, and be and to to be very free. Yes. It's almost like when you're describing it, I get the sense of like a current that can flow. Water is a, a good way to describe it in a way that it, it, it's not rigid. It's, it's not contained. Whatever may be happening, it, it has the ability to adapt and flow with it. Can you tell us a little bit, what do you do professionally? I work for an analyst firm uh, for the financial services industry, and I, I sell uh, the research and consulting that our analysts produce. So you're, you're in sales? Yes. Excellent. I'd love to ask you, what today, what role does your meditation practice play in your daily life? I try and practice daily, if at all possible. I get up early in the morning and... Somewhere in my morning before I go to work, I will usually meditate for about 45 minutes to an hour a day. So why? Why do you still do it? I know when we were in that yoga and meditation ashram for 15 years, it was part of our daily practice. Why do you do it today? Why do you continue to practice? That's a good question. You know, for a, a lot of different reasons, but I think the, the thing that comes to my mind is there is something so... Um, beautiful and, and unique experience to meditation. It's something that I just want to start every day with. And it's something that sets me off on the right foot. It gives me a kind of grounding and a very deep inspiration at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's just, just something that I, I feel is really in, in, important to my life and makes it better. That's awesome. I mean, I can relate a thousand percent. Do you feel like meditation supports your work in sales? And if it does, how? Yeah, I, I think the, the main way it supports them, I, I, I couldn't say exactly there's like a ratio between hours on the cushion and like number of salesmen made. But like, I do think that there's something about experiencing uh, something so um, deep and, and rich and, and full before I go to work that I, I come into work on a different foot. You know, I, yeah. I, I feel that, you know, my, my personal goal is that before I go to to work every morning, I, I want to really feel like I, I've had a very full day. 
and and meditation is usually an integral part of that. So I th- I think that what that means practically is that I come I come into work already feeling some degree of, of fulfillment, and that allows me just to work at a hundred percent to really just be in my work and 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 go for it because uh, something inside of me already feels uh, satisfied. So let me just recap there. Like you said that you feel like you've already accomplished something very deep and profound before you've even gotten to work. And in a sense, I get from what you're saying that it's almost like you're optimizing your mind and your body and yourself to be successful in the day. I think that being successful, that there, there is something about feeling that, that kind of inner beauty that does optimize me for success. Because mm-hmm. I know when I meditate first thing every day and I try to do that these days, it fundamentally colors the way I look at the day. I resonate with a lot of the ways that you described it, but I feel my attention is more open. I'm more aware of everything in my environment, but also there's a resting in myself where somehow the way I move through the world is different. I'm consolidated. I'm focused. I'm fully in myself. And yet at the same time, I'm in, I'm at rest. And in that, the word that stuck out for me that you used is there's a kind of beauty in resting in that place. When you come into the world, when you come into the day, you don't come at it from a place of fear or stress. You come at it from a place of fullness. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I was, I was I was just thinking about what you were saying, and the thing with I'm sure anyone who's in sales on your call knows sales is it's a very kind of a raw activity. Yeah. You know, it's it's very just immediate. Uh, you you kind of you you're sort you're sort of in a, in a very raw action oriented environment. Co- coffee, and so, coffee is for closers. Co- coffee is, is for put that coffee down. That's right. <laughs> you know, what, I think what whatever kind of sales, it's it's very it's it's just you know you're just kind of in the middle of it. So I because I've been meditating for years, I've been in sales for you know almost as long as I've been, I've been meditating. And so I, I would say what what happens in kind of in the way that you're describing is there's there's almost like a spillover effect, you know, mm-hmm. because it's like what what happens to us on the inside. It does it, you can't really keep it bottled up. I, I find that we're I try and we try, but we can't really keep that compartmentalized. So it's like you experience that kind of depth and beauty, the heart level. It does pop out or spill out in one way or the other in, in the way that you're taking the world or the way that I might respond to someone or the way I'm feeling things. I wouldn't say I'm not so conscious that I can connect it back to exa- exactly what was happening while I was on the cushion that morning. But I, I know, I, I guess the only way I can say, I know my, my heart is full. And so I respond differently to life if my heart's full than if I'm, if I feel depleted or somehow my soul feels restless. Yeah, I've done some sales and I know every time I get on, and again, this was a long time ago, but every time I got on the phone, you have to overcome a hurdle. You have to overcome some, well, of course, there's just an internal monologue that's going strong, which is all about the anxiety, the fear, the apprehension related to talking to someone you don't know, trying to convince them that what you have to offer is valuable to them. And because the world is now so sensitive to sales in so many ways, there must be, how how does it affect that moment? Because in the way you're talking about it, when I relate to sales, it's almost like a desperate thing. You're coming to sales and you're like, okay, I got to make... I got to close this next call. But the way you were describing it is almost completely the opposite, coming from a place of fullness and a place of of richness almost. And that's what really struck me when you just spoke about that. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's interesting because I was just just thinking about, you know, more of my my recent experiences. And, you know, there there are some calls or meetings I, I'm really looking forward to because I like the person or I like what we're going to talk about. And there's some that, you know, I'm thinking about throughout the day, like, oh, this particular call is coming up. And I, and I do have a kind of apprehension towards it. But I, I would think then either one, whether it's a call I'm looking forward to or if it's one that I feel like I have to prepare for and kind of steal myself up for, what's similar is that there is a, you know, when you talked about current before, there is a, a kind of hum, uh, a sort of vibration 
that I, I, I want to communicate through my, my voice and body that I need to be in. And so I, I find sometimes it takes a lot of effort, sometimes it doesn't, but it, there, there is that vibration is something that I want to be as let go into as I can in whatever I'm doing. And you feel in, in many ways that starts with meditation or it starts with what you connect with in meditation. I think meditation makes you sensitive to it. I think mm -hmm. meditation is kind of this like privilege to kind of like do a, a belly flop into it. Cause I think, cause I, I think what I've been more, in, what I've been very captivated by lately, which is related to meditation, but yeah, you know, it's actually, it's very related. Maybe it's even a different word for it, but it's, it's about silence, you know, mm -hmm. and, and silence as uh not as the absence of noise, but silence as kind of a living presence. You know, it has almost a physical quality to it, but it's also as uh, undescribable as how, how do you describe what silence is? Because it's silence, but yet at the same time, there, there is something that is felt. And so I, I think that dimension of silence is something that is accessed very uh, actively in meditation. But it's something also I'm seeking out throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So I know you're also right now, when we're having this call, you're in the middle of a self generated work retreat. You are writing an ebook right now. Can you tell us a little bit about one, a little bit about the book? But I know you're also an artist. You're a writer, you host and produce different events that incorporate music and philosophy and speakers. How do you feel that meditation supports your work as an artist, if at all? Does it? Definitely. I, I would say that the, the connection between meditation and my art, to, to me, feels much more clear than meditation and my work, or at least feels more explicit. You know, obviously... Th that's, I think that's a great distinction, by the way. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're both obviously informed by it, and I, I think that I'm a better sales professional because of meditation, no doubt. But uh, I more consciously enact the relationship between meditation and my art than I do with meditation and selling. Mm -hmm. The ebook I'm working on right now, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, thinking I've been doing about the relationship between love and time. But I, I want to express these ideas in, in, in a fictional narrative rather than just writing out my philosophical ideas. I, I'm, I'm endeavoring to try and somehow convey my thoughts and questions about it in a way that can be felt more through a story. And, you know, hopefully, you know, a person will have, you know, can have some kind of experience of it. I, I'm trying. Right. Um, yeah. And I would say the way writings, writings, not easy. Writing's not, no, the, it's hard. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's so satisfying, but it's so hard. And that's also, I think the beauty of it is just, it's you and yourself, you know, you, you don't there with the paper and, yeah. and, and just and trying to create a, create a universe. And so, the role meditation plays in that is um, all of us have all kinds of, of for myself, right? I have many disparate ideas and inspirations. I think of something that inspires me. There's an image that moves me. There's a, a feeling I want to convey, but they all seem very scattered. You know, like one of them's up in the corner of my mind. The other, I'm kind of feeling very strongly when I listen to a song. Another is something I might have read in a book. When I meditate, I feel there's something in the silence of meditation, that naturally these disparate ideas become in, somehow meditation finds the wholeness between all of those parts. Mm, it, that, that's beautifully put. Yeah, it's, it's, some, it's, it's like in, in a way that if I try to think it out, would, would probably look very artificial. Often meditation, I find meditation can create the through line between all those ideas or a form will emerge that integrates all of them beautifully. You know, and, and also I think that there is a, you know, where does creativity come from? Where, you know, we, we have a, I find that I have a, a desire or a yearning to express something. Of course, it's part of it's me, but who put that idea in me? Where did that idea come from? Sometimes it feels like something that I, I I'm more responding to. So sometimes I, I see art as a way of how can I uh, pull that idea, the idea out of myself and, and into the world. And often it, as I pull it out, I, I find that it connected to something that just doesn't feel like 
my memory or, or, or my mind. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like meditation, it's sort of opening that, the canal that that's coming through. It's, it's, it's relaxing that canal. It's, it's, it's allowing with more ease and grace for the, the, the fullness of that idea to come through without more as it, as it actually, uh, as it feels more deeply in my heart before I add my criticisms and my opinions and my, before I meddle with it a bit too much. That brings me to a question. It's almost like a technical question I have, which is, I know sometimes when I'm sitting in meditation, in many of the ways you described, there's a, it's like a a creative field that emerges in my awareness. It's like all these ideas start to percolate. And as you beautifully said, meditation sometimes shows you a picture in which they're, they're all connected. They're all, there's, there's, as you said, a wholeness between them. Of course, meditation is all about doing nothing. It's about not touching anything that comes up in your awareness, except for your, you know, following your meditation instructions. So for people who are just starting to meditate, you and I have a lot of experience of sitting in that field and just letting it be, not touching it, just letting it in a certain way, letting it come, letting it go. So two questions, like how do you harness that creative energy that you just described that often will naturally emerge out of meditation, um, like a dam bursting? So that's one question. And then how does that relate to not touching any of it? It's a paradox because part of what makes that possible in meditation, that creative field, is that it's our commitment to not do anything with it in that moment when it's emerging. Great question. I was just thinking about this, you know, because like sometimes there are times when you just sit on the cushion or maybe you're out taking a walk or, or you're sitting down outside or whatever's happening. And then it, it's like you're hit by a bolt of lightning and you just, just sit. Yeah. Um, but obviously it's, it's not like that every time. But what I do feel like is the way I see meditation as being a practice is because, uh, yeah, as you said that, and the action of, of doing of nothing or of not touching it, you know, what does it mean to do that with all of one's heart and with all of one's love? You know, which I guess is another kind of paradox, but it, it is something that you can give yourself to completely. And, and to me, that's one of the joys of meditation it, it is the, the act of being able to do something so fully, you yes. know, because so, so often we, we, circumstances keep us from not being able to do something completely because we have other commitments or other complications that just sitting down, being quiet, doing nothing. It it, it can be a, a, a total act. Yes. And I think that in a way one's enacting wholeness by allowing oneself to, to love what, what one is doing when one is sitting to, to love it, to really love something fully. And, and I think it, that's, it, it, that's beautiful. Yeah, I think in and of itself, there's value in just being able to to do that, whatever one's experience ha- happens to be. And again, it's a paradox, right? Because how, you know, how do you exert love? You know, how how do you put your back into loving something? It does it, that doesn't quite work. But at the same time, it, it is uh, one can be there fully in it and continue to give more and more of, of, of oneself. In a certain way, you spoke to something a little deeper than what I asked you, which was you really spoke about the possibility and potential inherent whenever you sit down to give everything to your practice and how how rare that is to actually find a space in our super busy lives where you can do that. You can really absolutely, completely, and totally let everything go. And you described the beauty in doing that. One of my questions was... In a certain way, you answered the first part of my question about that creative field, which is there there seems to be a paradox where like obviously what you described, that wholeness, that total giving over, that's in a certain way, that's the ground out of which that kind of creative field emerges. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Right. And then the second part of the question is how then so much of the practice is then just, you just continue to let that be. How do you find that 
you, when you're off the cushion, do you remember those connections? Do you pause your meditation and take notes? What do you do to harness that incredibly powerful creative field that emerges? Often, I, I feel this, like I think some people experience it like in the shower or if they're going for a swim or something like, but there are unusual moments where that kind of creative field just emerges out of nothing. And suddenly that wholeness you described is just there and you have a kind of creative lightning bolt. But then how do you, how do you harness it? That's really my question after you get off the cushion. And and this is just a, a personal question for you. How, how does that, how does that work for you? You know, I think that in the way I was talking about being able to, to love your practice fully, to be able to, you know, give myself completely to it, to have that um, opportunity to pour myself into something. I, I think that, that, that action is something that's applicable to just about anything that you care about because in meditation, you're not doing anything, but that, that sort of giving oneself, it's something that I, I'll say it happens at like the, at the heart level, you know, the heart and being the psychic, uh, psychic, not as in like teleconnect powers, but psychic is like your, your soul, your inner stratum. It, it's a energy you're exerting there. If I am working on my book or if I'm at work or if I'm with people, I, I wouldn't say quite that I remember it, but there, there's something so, um, inspiring and, and life affirming and um fulfilling to to be that way as much as possible just because it, it feels deep and right yeah i think it's more just a habit if anything uh, from developing the habit that, that one is yeah. in that habit of living and being like that that's that's exactly the word that came to mind when you were talking was a, a habit it's almost like because that translation that you were describing, a lot of people refer to that as being in the zone, being in a flow state. In a certain way, what I heard you saying is like you're cultivating a deep habit of being in that zone or being in that flow state where you're fully in the moment, you're fully in what you're doing. And in a certain way, meditation is an incredibly, it's a very specific time in which you're practicing or you're creating the habit, you're practicing that act of totality or wholeness or, or giving oneself over completely. Because in the end, what you're doing is you're giving all of your attention to one thing. Do, would you agree with that? I, I would agree with um, everything except I, I wish I could say that I, I, I felt like I was in the zone more often. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, it hasn't felt like all this translating me into having, you know, superhuman athletic abilities or, or things, but it does translate into um, a, a joyful kind of effort that I work hard for th- whatever I do not to be mediocre at it. Yeah. I, I wish I could say I had that, that zone quality that people talk about when they do these like amazing stunts and things. But I, I, I think it's cool. We're talking about it. It creates a, a habit of, of being to, to love whatever one is doing fully. Another word I w- that came to mind for me in terms of what you're describing is mindfulness. When I meditate in the morning, then whether I'm doing customer service or eating breakfast or running an errand, there's a quality of that full attention that you're describing in what I'm doing. And I know I feel like in a certain way meditation is the battery for that. Right. Is that a word that somewhat captures what you're talking about? It does when I think about how when one is not mindful, one is distracted. It's like you can think of all those activities doing it not mindful. If you're like, you're angry or you're brooding about something or you're, you're not there with the person you're eating breakfast with. And so in that way, I'd say, I'd say definitely. It's not a word that I, I've used a lot, but I think what a lot of people do, it, they probably maybe would agree with the same thing I'm saying. I guess in mindful in the way that we're speaking about, there's... um. Yeah, I know. I keep I keep on coming back to love in this conversation. You know, yeah. when I say love, there, there's a very human and mm-hmm. transcendent quality, a kind of larger than a context of being something that you can't quite see, but you feel something something beyond you. Yeah. Sometimes I'm not, when people say mindful, I'm I'm not sure whether they mean that. But like, if I was going to use mindful, I, I feel like what I strive for that quality is part of it. 
I have another question. It's unrelated. How, how did you come to meditation originally? Why did you start? And I know that probably is going to take you. It's like jump back 15 or 20 years. I'm curious also for our listening audience who come to meditation for a variety of reasons. Why did you start? Sure. I mean, actually, it probably it goes back like to when I was a teenager. My, my parents, I guess you'd call them scientific materialists. They weren't religious. They weren't even atheists because they, for them, the, the whole question of God wasn't even really much of a concern worth debating. So it just wasn't something that was discussed or looked into much, you know, in, in my family growing up. They're both they're both scientists, right? They're 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 both yes. They're, my father's a doctor. My my mother got her doctorate in biochemistry, and they're you know they're beautiful, ha- happy. Some of those you know my mother's one of those positive people I know. Yeah, as far as the, the mysteries of the inner dimension, is just something she's not that interested in or mm-hmm. puts a lot of attention on. But it was something you know since I was young, I I couldn't shake this feeling that I felt there there had to be more to life than what I could see or, or touch or feel, you know, cause I could, I could feel it inside me, but I couldn't see it anywhere outside of me. And then, so I explored a, a lot of things when I was young to try and learn more about that. So I, I came across meditation through just reading a lot of books and going to a lot of groups and doing th- different things. And then, you know, so I had been looking into and studying that for years and until you know, both you and I met Andrew Cohen around the same time when, when I thought, okay, I, I really wanted to get serious about pursuing this with a, a formal practice, with studying very closely with one teacher and going into depth with a particular approach. If you were now to offer a tip or advice or a few words of wisdom to someone who is just starting now, what, what would you say? I often liken meditation a lot to running. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if someone was just starting to run for the first time, you never, it'd be crazy to expect them to do it, to anyone to do a marathon when they which haven't been Which you've done. You've done how many marathons? Uh, I've done four marathons, but I've run marathon distances a lot. What's, what's the longest marathon you've run? 55 miles. All right. I, I planted that question, everyone. It's just, it's, <laughs> it, it Ken's is a, a pretty amazing guy and he ran this 55 mile ultra marathon and he's incredible he's run the boston marathon a number of times but sorry go ahead so so you know like the metaphor if you if, if you never like run a mile before you you can't go out and do 26 miles similarly if you're just starting to meditate trying to do an hour would just probably not be productive whatever you're starting at and you're feeling that kind of groove with whether, whether it's like five, 10, 15 or 20 minutes. I mean, I, I would say that a good thing to do is like somewhat periodically give yourself a, a long run challenge. Say that you've just kind of done 10 minutes off and on consistently. Then, you know, maybe sometime in the near future, really plan to do like 30 minutes or something. I think the important element is that you're excited about doing it. Maybe you're a little bit, you know, you have a, a, you're a little bit apprehensive about it, but more of you is kind of excited to kind of go into the deep end of where you haven't been before. And I, I think if you have those periodic challenges that you give yourself that you're both excited by and, and, and it's somewhere you haven't been before, but you also know you could do it. I think those kind of, those doing that, something good will always come out of it. Either you'll find out it was, you know, the deep end wasn't as deep as you thought, or you'll, you'll learn something just by, you know, meeting your own challenge or you'll, you'll find out that like, wow, it's, it's a big world out here. And I, I, I just think doing that also, it, it'll, it'll take your practice forward and push your, it, it'll affect everything else just from doing it. Fantastic. Kenzo, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing your wisdom and your experience and these stories with us. And I know everyone really appreciates it. So thank you. Thank you, Morgan. It was, it was great to talk with you about this. It's something that we've shared a lot for years. So I, I, I love talking about this with you. Likewise. Bye, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode and got some useful information and inspiration from it. If you want to learn more about Kenzo's work, I highly recommend you sign up for his weekly newsletter. It's called The Signal. 
And you can sign up for that over at his blog at loftsessions.co. And I'll include that link below in the show notes. Kenzo sends out super interesting videos, quotes, and reflections on culture once a week. We'll be publishing this podcast weekly. And if you'd like to get notified about new episodes, you can subscribe to the podcast, which you can do either on your phone or you can sign up at our general email list. And that's at about meditation.com. Again, I'll put that in the show notes. And if you like the show and if you want to help us out, please leave us a review over at iTunes. The more reviews we get, the more iTunes likes us. And then we'll have a chance to get featured in their new and noteworthy section. So I will include links for all of this in the show notes. And this show is brought to you by our free How to Meditate mini course. If you're looking for a simple way to learn meditation, this course will teach you how to meditate in five easy lessons. We've had nearly 5,000 people take the course, and the best part is that it's free. So check it out. I think you're going to love it. You can sign up for at aboutmeditation.com. I think that covers it. Till next time, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your time. I'd like to end with a quote. This one is from the renowned Rinpoche, Tibetan Rinpoche, Chogyam Trungpa, who said, Meditation is another dimension of natural beauty. People talk about appreciating natural beauty, climbing mountains, seeing giraffes and tigers in Africa, and all sorts of things. But nobody seems to appreciate this kind of natural beauty of ourselves. This is actually far more beautiful than flora and fauna. Far more fantastic, far more painful and colorful and delightful.